Welcome. Thank you for coming by. Great to be with you. The first question, I think, has to be, what is the most important thing you want voters to know about you? Well, I'm a Christian. I'm a father and a husband. Um, I come from a family that puts service to country, to the Constitution, to the laws of our state over anything else. Uh, I think this agency has been disgraced um, for conservatives, for the state of Texas, and frankly, an embarrassment for our nation. It's been a privilege to serve as land commissioner the last seven years, but my wife and I have 18 years with two boys, Prescott and Jack, who are nine and seven now, um, really have come to a conclusion that Texas deserves better, that our party deserves to have somebody that can champion important values under the Constitution, fighting federal overreach, standing up to liberal progressive mayors that stand against directives of freedom, uh, but to actually win in the courthouse and to do so with integrity. That's, that's what my campaign is all about, is cleaning up government, cleaning up corruption. Which leads to a follow-up question. What is it you most want voters to know about your opponent, Ken Paxton? Well, he's abused office at every turn. He's literally cheated at everything in his life. He's been around the Capitol for 22 years. He's cheated on his wife. He's cheated um, the Constitution by trying to get a preemptive federal pardon from President Trump by disregarding the 10th Amendment. And I'm old enough as a constitutional conservative to respect states' choices on different issues. And he's honestly lied to the people of Texas about his own FBI investigation, the bribes that he's taken, and the abuse of his office. And so I challenged him uh, to 10 debates to talk about these issues. He refuses to engage the public or the media, um, including the Freedom of Information Act discussion on First Amendment rights in, in Texas. So um, he's going to run a Joe Biden-style campaign from his closet. I'm going to continue to run around the state and talk to conservatives about who the right choice is in this race. So restoring integrity to this office, is it enough to, to say I'm not under FBI investigation or do you have a plan for that? I think on day one when voters ask, what are you going to do on day one that's different from Ken? I'm going to travel this entire state and talk to county DAs because we've got to restore trust not only with the Capitol and the legislature because there are huge voids in criminal law that are not being addressed. Um, work with county DAs because we can work on a concurrent jurisdictional basis with local DAs on a lot of issues but are not being addressed. I can't tell you, Chuck, how many DAs, uh, Democrat, Republican, that say they haven't gotten a call from our state's attorney general. Um, Democrat DAs now that are saying that they want help on Operation Lone Star to enforce criminal trespassing claims. They need help from the state of Texas. They're getting it from DPS, they're getting it from National Guardsmen, but not from a legal perspective. So that will change on day one. Uh, I've been criticizing Ken on human trafficking, obtaining only two convictions in the last four years, which is unacceptable. That requires an AG that actually sits down like you and I are in their offices, show some humility, some supplication, and show that the state of Texas is, is supporting you. So that's step one is DAs, work with the ledge, and then restore trust with the people of Texas. Ken Paxson has several endorsements that he sees as uh, critical to his success, named you know, Donald Trump, uh, Dan Patrick. Um, how do you counter that? Well, typically, if you are not inappropriately touching women or not criminally indicted, that the Trump endorsement does help you. But in this case, Ken Paxson has failed on, on both scores. Um, when I talk to everyday constituents, they're like, we need to secure the border now. We need to clean up our streets. We need to address voting fraud. Those are the top three questions. And so um, the Trump endorsement does have weight, but when it comes down to this runoff, people are like, we need somebody who's above approach, somebody who's, who's gonna actually listen to my concerns and not try to stay out of jail in order to address these big issues that, that we need to, to, to confront. Are there one or two key endorsements you uh, point to? My top endorsement is the National Border Patrol Council, led by Brandon Judd. He's the personal advisor to Donald Trump on border-related issues. He represents the 19,000 agents that keep the watch. Um, number two would be the uh, 52 law enforcement organizations that are backing me in this race, including the Fort Worth uh, Police Association that know that I'm going to back law enforcement mm -hmm. as the top law enforcement official. Um, and then I would say uh, human trafficking survivors throughout the state of Texas are, are behind me because they know that I helped to pass the SMART Act, which elevated the age by which uh, folks can work in sexually oriented businesses in Texas to 21. So these are you know, authentic, real world endorsements that affect everyday Texans 
Um, and, and I think that moves the needle more with, with uh, Republican voters. All right. Ken Paxton has criticized you for feeling you're entitled to this job by virtue of your name. Um, how do you respond to that? Well, that's Rich coming from a 22-year swamp creature who um, has done virtually nothing in, in the last four years. And if anything, he's the one who's running an entitled campaign. He is not, I, I did 12 debates with uh, Justice Guzman and Congressman Gohmert. Uh, I challenged him to an additional 10. He refuses to engage. And I traveled around the state. I have yet to see a, a poster or actually somebody publicly say that they support the guy. And my message to Republicans is if you cannot with pride say to a fellow employee in your place of work or in your church or place of worship or to your children that you support Ken Paxton, then don't vote for him. You got to actually be proud of who you support and who you get behind. And, and Ken fails in every score in that respect. Polling indicates you're having trouble establishing your conservative credentials with the GOP base. Uh, what's your message for them? So Dallas Morning News actually, and maybe that's why I have a bright smile on my face this morning, reported yesterday that we are on a rocket ship and um, we were written off as dead early on in this runoff and now within the margin of error. I think what's happening out there in this changing landscape are that Republicans are formulating a base of support against corruption. Um, my supporters are dug in deep, the poll really indicates. And we find, we're finding that Justice Guzman and Congressman Gomer's supporters are coming over. So really, the only poll we're operating off of is that close to 60% of Republicans voted against a Trump-endorsed candidate in this race. Uh, they're voting against corruption. They're voting against hypocrisy, lack of transparency, and lies. And so. Like I said before, he's not running a grassroots campaign in, in a tightly fought race where we think voting turnout is going to be extraordinarily low. So we're really asking your readers and your viewers to go out there and start voting today because with 300,000 votes, every vote will make a difference. And the tie is going to go to the runner, as they say in baseball, and that's our organization where we have 600 volunteers working throughout the state, block walking, phone banking. Um, which I forgot to mention, Texas State firefighters, they're behind us. That's 21,000 firefighters. They'll be block walking and phone banking too. The order should be labeled an invasion. Why is that? Well, the clear distinction I want to make very clear to your readers is the difference between prior cases before the Supreme Court that identify illegals as the invaders as opposed to border drug cartels, which is my legal argument. Uh, Mark Bronovich, who is the Attorney General over in Arizona, was the first to draft an advisory opinion to this extent, um, saying that under Article 4, Section 4 of the US Constitution sets forth the invasion clause and that under Article 1, Section 10 states that st states can protect themselves if, the, if they deem that the federal government's not protecting them. So that's the role of the AG is to establish that legal basis through an advisory opinion, which Ken Paxton has not done. Uh, though Matt Krause, who formerly was in this race, as in his capacity as a member of the legislature has asked the AG's office to weigh in on. My role would be to support Governor Abbott's Operation Lone Star, making sure he has the legal flexibility to draft a mission state specific to what the needs are for law enforcement down on the border. Is that distinction between cartels and people enough in this situation because we have racists embracing the we're under invasion uh, rhetoric including the El Paso shooter who killed 23 people, claiming it was in response to a Hispanic invasion. How can you walk that line carefully and not make the problem worse? The distinction is, and that's, the distinction is very important, um, uh, not only legally, but with respect to rhetoric. Um, because again, as the AG, if, if you're running to be the top law enforcement official, you need to, if anything, not throw f uh, fuel on the fire it's to dissipate um, and extinguish the fire in, in many communities in Texas. And that's why legally the Supreme Court has weighed in on this by saying that illegals in and of themselves are not invaders for purposes of the Constitution. Um, but it is novel and that's why Mr. Bronovich deserves a lot of credit for presenting it and saying that it's the cartels that are perpetrating it in the form of giving a false sense of hope to illegals, profiting off of this trade of human trafficking and moving fentanyl across our border. And with that untested theory, that, that gives lower courts the ability to hear a case and perhaps view this in a different lens and potentially make its way to the Supreme Court. 
Do you believe gender-affirming medical care should be investigated as child abuse? Uh, I do. Um, I've, I've said early on that in Texas, that among minors, that the practice should, be, uh, should not be permitted. Um, I think that the way that it was handled also was incorrect by Ken Paxton. Um, first of all, by not drafting an advisory opinion that made it clear that it is abuse. Um, while he has accepted close to $300,000 from two political action committees that um, conduct gender transformation uh, processes in Texas. I just believe, um, mainly led by my faith, that we shouldn't allow that practice to occur in Texas for minors in Texas and that, um, again, providing the legal structure by which the governor can, through his leadership of DFPS, the Family Protective Services Agency for Texas, can uh, investigate and make sure that it's, that it's not permitted in Texas. Do you, see a, do you see a distinction between puberty blockers and hormone treatments, for example? Uh, I don't. Um, so I, my viewpoint is, is that the practice should be eradicated among minors. Now, I don't, I, I think above the age of 18, uh, as we do with a lot of other things in Texas, that we define you at a, an adult level and that you can make a lot of your decisions on your own. Now, puberty um, blockers by age 18 is way too late for, I would say, 90-something high percent of teenagers experiencing gender dysphoria. Are we relegating them to not treating a medical condition, an acknowledged medical condition dysphoria? Um, you know, I'm, I'm you know, of a position that anything that's blocking the, uh, the natural progression of, of uh, our development, both as boys and as girls, uh, I'm gonna be dead set against on a personal level. But as a lawyer uh, for the state of Texas, I wanna make sure that law that is clearly drafted by the legislature is accurately reflected in advisory opinions and making sure that uh, whether it's DFPS or local agencies or CPS, that deal with uh, children don't have that ability to encourage the, the movement there. All right. And it wouldn't be an interview without a Roe v. Wade question. <laughs> um, what did you think of the draft opinion as released? Well, first of all, as a former federal clerk, I, I've got to tell you that I've, I'm very disappointed with the act of the individual. I think uh, Chief Justice Roberts is absolutely right in, in bringing in the FBI to investigate this because there's supposed to be a cone of silence within a courtroom, um, particularly in a arguably the most important decision in a generation. So um, really disappointed in the behavior of the clerk to try to politicize this. Uh, secondly, uh, I'm, I'm pro-life. I believe life begins at conception. So, you know, as a constitutional conservative, and I joked about it before, but I'm very serious in saying that the 10th Amendment is clear that the founders were, were thoughtful and that any enumerated powers not explicitly described in the Constitution are reserved to the states and to the people of, of this country. And so, Let's let Texas decide what the, what the decision is on uh, this very passionate issue on both sides of the aisle and allow, and that's why I was against Ken Paxton's uh, lawsuit on, on these grounds because that allows New Yorkers and Californians to decide how Texans should decide questions of life. So um, what this means for Texas, assuming the draft opinion is ordered in June, is that our trigger law will be in effect, which I support and I supported during this past legislative session. I'll defend it in the courthouse, but there's also a new frontier in terms of chemically induced uh, abortion pills and a trade there that occurs um, and monitoring the enforcement of that law. So um, that's where I stand on the issue and uh, I'm proud to be pro-life. Should Texas criminalize women leaving the state for an abortion in a state where it's legal after the decision? If the legislature drafts a law to that extent, um, I think where the legislature is more likely to move is to not do businesses with, uh, or allow business to do business with Texas that allow for so-called abortion vacations, mm -hmm. which we've seen a few companies announce, um, and that the state is very serious uh, on this issue. But um, that gets into questions of commerce clause and enforcement uh, across its boundary and state lines. So as a good lawyer, I just want to manage people's expectations that that's going to be challenging to do. Yes, <laughs> that would be. Uh, you had mentioned a Ken Paxton lawsuit in your previous answer. I was wondering which one you were referring to. 
Um, the election integrity suit. The one against the four states. To, Exa exactly. That's what I thought. Yeah. I just wanted... yeah. I mean, a good lawyer follows Bush v. Gore and challenges in the jurisdiction of question before election day, not as a Hail Mary attempt to try to get a preemptive federal pardon from the, from the Trump White House. Anything else you'd like to add? Voting starts today, wraps up on Friday. Tuesday's the big day. As I mentioned, voting turnout's going to be really low. Um, we want Texans to have their voice heard. Um, and I think that if Ken wins this race, two things happen. I think the Democrat wins, and it looks like it'll be Rochelle Garza on the other side. Um, and that'll be the first Democrat statewide office holder in over 30 years. So I'm not going to sit on the sidelines. Um, number two, I do think he gets perp walked for the second time in his second term as attorney general. And I believe that uh, the U.S. attorney for the Western District of Texas will drop indictments from a federal grand jury. And that'll occur before election day to further guarantee the first point. Um, and that's, that's, that's too much of a risk and a liability for Republicans to take. So why not go with somebody who's going to win in the fall, uh, fight for good values, but not going to jail and not under indictment. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. it.